lecture is, is on transparent conducting oxides. And, and the reason for including this, of course, is that TCOs, I'm not going to say transparent conducting oxide every time, TCOs are involved in, in all types of thin film solar cells, SIGs, cadmium telluride, molten silicon, in, in all cases. And the, the, the point that this material, incidentally, is, is taken from a, a class that I used to teach for the, the uh, American Vacuum Society. And, and uh, that was either an eight hour or a 16 hour class, um, a one day or a two day class. And uh, it, it's, it's very easy for me to talk about TCOs for eight or 16 hours. It's very difficult for me to talk about them in one hour. I'll try to do so. The main point about TCOs is that they have a, a relatively high optical transmittance. They have a transmittance of about 85%. It's not like transmittance of light through perfect glass. Glass transmits light, light a lot better than a TCO does. On the other hand, the TCO conducts electricity an awful lot better than the glass. It doesn't conduct electricity as well as good quality metal like silver or aluminium, but it comes producing huge amounts of glass per year. The applications are becoming more and more demanding, and in my view, there's been uh, an increase in need to understand the properties of the TCOs more thoroughly for many years now. Um, in, in fact, we've been working on TCOs at NREL uh, one way or another for at least 25 years at, at this point. There's a tendency to assume that the TCO is, is a matter of no consequence in a, in a solar cell, whereas in fact it may well dictate the uh, eventual efficiency of a finished device. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, the uh, properties and, and the, the fundamental science of, of TCOs in this. Uh, there's a need to uh, appreciate the way in which the TCO film affects the device performance. And it's not always just by absorbing the light and, and lowering the JSC. And finally, I would say that when you, when you realize that glass companies, when they, when they manufacture a glass, they manufacture in widths of around about three to four meters. And yet, that glass is being coated with a TCO as it comes hot off the float bath that's used to make the very flat material. So there's really great opportunities to advance the TCO knowledge. TCOs have got wide band gaps, typically around about 3.5 to 4 electron volts. We wouldn't normally expect materials with such a large band gap to conduct electricity very well at all, because we wouldn't expect them to have very many intrinsic carriers. <clears throat> However, they can be extrin extrinsically doped with uh, cations from one group higher than the periodic table. For example, substituting aluminium from group three on the zinc two plus site will add an electron to the conduction band. Intrinsic oxygen vacancies are also believed to contribute to the carrier concentration, although that's a very, very debatable point. In extrinsically doped TCOs, not all of the impurities are ionized. Uh, not all of them are electrically active. And what that means is, of course, some of them remain neutral. And the problem with that is that if you've deliberately added an impurity that isn't donating additional carriers, then it can still lead to the scattering of electrons. So if you're going to add impurities, make sure that they are ionized. Otherwise, you'll simply harm the properties of the TCO. Whether they are or are not ionized generally depends on the fabrication conditions and, in general, on the substrate temperature during deposition. With extrinsic doping, it's always uncertain because the, 
the, the size of the impurities and that chemical activity has to, really has to be concerned. Titanium in tin oxide is a good example. Both tin oxide, both, both tin and titanium are from group four of the periodic table, one from 4B and one from 4A. But the problem is the titanium has an extremely high chemical affinity for oxygen. And sometimes it can form oxida ox oxide clusters and, uh, and cause the resistivity to rise. And even if the impurities are all electrically active, they still, to some extent, impair the electron mobility because they, have, they are ionized impurities. There's a potential associated with them, and therefore they can scatter the, the charge that's moving around. So in both cases, whether they are ionized or not, they scatter charge. <coughs> PV, if you think of thin film solar cells, if we want to make a gigawatt of thin film cells, like first solar already does, probably more like two gigawatts now, then that requires around about four square miles. This would be for a 10% efficient module. Something like four square miles, 10 square kilometers. So that tells you that we're working in multiples of square kilometers, multiple of tens of square kilometers, for TCO coated glass. When I prepared this slide many years ago, the American glass companies were making around about 20 square miles of tin oxide coated glass per year. And in fact, this number will be increased quite considerably now. They're also used in low emissivity coatings in architecture, preventing roofs from getting too hot in the summer or too cold in the winter. We also incorporate TCOs in electrochromic cells and in dye-sensitized cells. Flat panel displays, of course, an enormous market. Indium tin oxide is used by all of the flat panel display um, manufacturers. And thin film PV, I think it's fair to say, assuming that this multiple gigawatt market for thin film cells continues to grow, as Ramesh was showing this morning, then in fact, the demand by the PV industry, the thin film PV industry, will far exceed that of the flat panel display industry. I hope this shows up okay. These are schematics of the, the two polycrystalline cells, cartellurite and CIGS. Here's the light coming in. In this case, the cartellurite passing first through this white rectangle that is the substrate. The first layer is the TCO, in this case, tin oxide. The yellow layer is cadmium sulfide. The red layer is the P-type, the likely P-type cadmium telluride. And then at the back here is a contact. I've shown it as P-type zinc telluride, although it may be other materials like copper-loaded graphite or even copper-loaded gold is being used. Copper is generally P-type zinc telluride itself contains copper. And it's, it's why we believe the copper helps provide the, the ormicity. In this case, on the right-hand side, we have the substrate is blue. The light is entering through the front of the cell, through the zinc oxide, in this case, and then the carbon sulfide layer, then the CIGS, then the molybdenum back contact of the substrate. The point is that in both cases, the light passes through the TCO. So we can't just choose any old TCO. We've got to think about the thickness of the TCO and its optical and its electrical properties. Remember, it's, it's performing two functions in the cell, perhaps three. Not only is it allowing light to pass into the cell, but it's also acting as an electrical contact to some extent whether or not a grid is used, the TCO is there to facilitate collection of the excess photo-generated charge. This is another example I, I like to show. It's a, a modeled um, thin film tandem cell. This is work that was done 10 or 11 years ago. And here we have the top cell consisting of n-type cadmium sulfide on, on 
some absorbent, some p-type absorbent, then a tunnel junction, p plus plus on n plus plus, then the bottom cell, again, n-type cadmium sulfide, and some bottom cell absorbent. When I did this modeling, it was very, very idealized. I assumed that all of the interfaces were specular. There wasn't any scattering at the interfaces. I was assuming that there wasn't any interfusion, no chemical reactions taking place. And the parametric, the parametric modeling that I did was really quite helpful in understanding potential thin film devices which haven't actually been made. DOE was very interested in this 10 or 11 years ago, but after only about two years, two years of research, they cancelled the work. Um, however, being DOE, they are once again interested and uh, are funding work on town and themselves. This, this is a rather unfortunate uh, uh, diagram. What I was plotting in this diagram was the band gap of the top cell versus the band gap of the bottom cell. And these are iso efficiency contours. The red contour near the center here is 25%. The other cross that you see there corresponds to 28.2%. So the absolute maximum on this set of iso efficiency contours is 28.2%. Now, this was an entirely lossless modeling pr performance that I did. And if I took into account realistic properties of the TCO layers, then the efficiency dropped to around about 25%. And at this time, 10 years ago, 25% was a 10-year goal for this project. And I'm confident that had research continued, then we would be at least in excess of 22% by now. And as it is, we're nowhere near that. So again, just to repeat, white band gap semiconductors, they have resistivities of about 10 to the minus 4 mole centimeters. Compare that with, say, 10 to the minus 6 for silver or aluminium. But they also transmit a lot of the solar spectrum very effectively. The problem is that the electrons that conduct electricity also interact with light and longer wavelengths. The electron of ensemble resonates with the incoming electric field vector, and we get this free carrier absorption in the near infrared. And the big question with TCOs is, how do we improve both the conductivity and the transmittance? I think it's fair to say that the properties haven't really been achieved significantly for many, many years. You can read papers from back in the 1960s from Bell Labs where people talk about 10 to minus 4 volt centimeters or thereabouts and 80 plus percent transmittance. We still aren't seeing transmittances greater than 90 percent and resistivities about 10 to minus 5. So I think it's fair to say that the properties haven't been uh, improved greatly. And the, the, the problem is that we only have two options. We can either improve uh, the, the existing materials that we have available. And there have been hundreds of research groups worldwide who have tried to do that, improving on sputtering techniques, iron plating techniques, solution growth, etc. Or we can look for new and better materials. And I view this as an intrinsic approach, whereas finding better ways of making existing materials is an extrinsic uh, approach. One of the striking characteristics about the TCOs is that they all have cations with filled D-shell electrons. If they didn't have, then the D-shells would be responsible for visible transitions, and we wouldn't have transparent conducting oxides. They would be conducting oxides, which is not transparent. And as I'll show you in a minute or two, the emphasis really has to be on increasing the free carrier mobility not on increasing the free carrier concentration. We need new approaches for low temperature substrates, for example, organic PV devices also involve TCOs. They are heat sensitive materials, 
So we have to find techniques for making higher performance TCOs at lower temperatures. So the long term goals, you might argue, are resistivity is better than 10 to minus 4 ohm centimeters. This would correspond to less than 2 ohms per square for a half micron thick film. Transmittances should be better than 85% across the visible wavelengths. Minimum free carrier absorbance in the visible. What that means is we can't have an excessively high free carrier concentration. I'll explain why soon. And we would like to see mobilities of greater than 100. Now, just to put that number into perspective, in manufacture, the electron mobility is typically about 20 centimeters squared per volt per second. In the research labs at NREL, values of 50 or 60 are, concerned, are con considered good. If we need values of over 100 routinely, then we still have a long way to go. The deposition and the post-deposition temperatures have to be compatible with the devices, with the solar cells that we're actually making. If our TCO is the last layer deposited, as it is in the case of the SIGS cell, then we can't deposit that at very high temperature. Usually if we want to optimize the properties of the TCO, we like to deposit at a temperature of about 350 centigrade. That would kill the CIGS cell. So we have to find effective ways of working with reduced temperatures, reduced deposition temperatures. For some applications, the infrared reflectance and the transmittance in the, the near UV are also important. With PV, we're not really so concerned about these. If we were working with TPV devices, as Chris touched on this morning, then we really would be worried about the infrared properties of the TCO because that's where the semiconductors that are used for TPV operate. The way we go about learning about our TCOs is to use Maxwell's equations derived in the 19th century, of course. And this, the, the Maxwell's equations, of course, show how the electrical and the optical properties of materials in general are inextricably linked. TCOs are no different to other materials. When we take Maxwell's equations and solve for our particular TCO, the very high carrier concentrations that we have in the TCO, we, we obtain, first of all, the real and imaginary parts of the dielectric permittivity. And then, from those values, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, we can obtain the real and imaginary parts of the refractive index, N and K. N is the refractive index, K is called the extinction coefficient. K is important because it relates to the absorption coefficient that I talked about in, in the last lecture. And in fact, 4 pi times K divided by wavelength gives us alpha of lambda. So these, this is a very, very simple, very elegant approach. Now we've got N and K. We, we can start to think about how to model the optical properties. These calculations, incidentally, were done for a carrier concentration of 5 times 10 to the 20, very typical for a TCO per cubic centimeter. The DC conductivity is given by sigma is equal to carrier concentration, electronic charge, mobility. Mu is the symbol we give to the mobility. E is the electronic charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Mu, of course, is equal to electronic charge times tau, which is the relaxation time. The relaxation time is the interval of time between successive randomized and collisions of electrons. As they move through our TCO, they collide and they are scattered. We assume that they are diffusely scattered they lose all memory of their previous direction and energy, and the electric field begins to accelerate them again. And time after which they are on average 
they are scattered once again, is known as tau, the relaxation time. And that is a vital parameter in TCO research. We really have been trying to learn how to increase tau, that is, make higher quality materials at very modest deposition conditions, very modest substrates as well. We can't afford to deposit these materials on single crystal substrates for epitaxial growth, you know. If we want to change the mobility, we can only do so by reducing the relaxation time, I'm sorry, increasing the relaxation time, or changing the effective mass, reducing the effective mass. Well, we don't have much choice about that. If we decide we're going to use tin oxide, or indium tin oxide, or zinc oxide, the effective mass is then determined. We can't do anything further. So really, the only variable at our disposal to work on is the relaxation time. What I'm going to talk about next is the effect of changing the various parameters in the TCO. Yeah, this is very difficult, I'm afraid. Um, okay. This white, what I'm plotting here is absorption versus wavelength. And I'm plotting, and the white curve, this represents a carrier concentration of 2 times 10 to 20. This blue curve represents a carrier concentration of 10 to 21. So we're increasing parametrically from 2 all the way up to 10 times 10 to 20. The film thickness is half a micron. The high frequency permittivity is 4.4 effective mass. And the relaxation time, in this case, 5 times 10 to 50 minus 15 seconds, 5 tenths of seconds. That corresponds to a mobility of 25. E times tau over m is equal to 25 centimeters squared per whole second. Now notice that the white curve doesn't even show the peak. It's actually off the screen, somewhere over here. The green curve, the peak is right there. The red curve is there. And the blue curve, right there. So two, two or three things to notice. As we increase the carrier concentration, going from there to there to there to there, the curve gets higher because there is an increasing carrier concentration to interact with the incoming photons curves get narrower, and that's actually because the conductivity is increasing. Conductivity is the quantity that appears in Maxwell's equations. And they move to a shorter and shorter wavelength. And that's very important. Along with this carrier concentration, 10 to the 21, the peak of this curve is at about 1.2 microns, and you can see that the short wavelength tail is actually extending into the visible part of the spectrum. So if we try to make a CIGS cell with a carrier, uh, using a TCO that has a carrier concentration of 10 to the 21, then we're going to lose a lot of the photons that should be absorbed by our CIGS even before they reach the CIGS. They'll be absorbed in the TCO. And that's why I said earlier, you can't simply slap down any old TCO. You've got to think about what, what you're doing in, in designing this material. So there's a number of important factors there. Remember, this was for a mobility of 25. I have no idea why this one works correctly. But again, absorption versus wavelength. And now we're looking at mobility as a parameter, starting with 10, 25, 50, and 100. Remember, I've told you that values of 20 are typical of those that are achieved in manufacture. Values of 100 are really a little bit beyond even what we can achieve in the research laboratory. So somewhere in this region is where we can realistically expect the work. Again, a half micron film, 4.4 per epsilon infinity, same effective mass, 
here's the range of carrier concentrations, uh, I'm sorry, mobilities, and a fixed carrier concentration of 5 times 10 to the 20 in this case. Now, the thing to notice is that as the mobility increases, the peak position of the absorption band doesn't change at all. And you can see the benefit of focusing on the mobility instead of the carrier concentration. The height of the free carrier absorption band drops remarkably from a, a mobility of 10 to a mobility of 100. And look at it along at these short wavelength regions. Remember, around about here is the band gap of cadmium telluride. So with the mobility of, if we can make a TCO with a mobility of 100, we're hardly losing any photons in the TCO. On the other hand, if we work with uh, a, a, a TCO with a mobility of only 10, then we're use, losing a lot of photons. So this, I think, emphasizes the point. So in this case, the summary is work with high mobilities if we possibly can. 1.7 and 1.1 correspond to the optimum band gaps for a tandem thin fold cell. And the point is made very nicely with those two, that we need these high mobility TCLs, otherwise our top cell will there'll be too many photons lost in the TCO, and of the photons that should have made it through to the bottom cell, many of those will be lost. We would be wasting our time trying to make a thin full town itself. Good. Again, same plot absorption versus wavelength. But in this case, we're looking at the variation of the film thickness, carrier concentration, permittivity, relaxation time, effective mass. Those two together corresponding again to a mobility of 25. Here's our tandem cell pair, 1.7 and 1.1. Half micron, very typical of what industry uses. But if we can afford to come down in thickness to 100 nanometers, then you can see the benefit of doing so. On the other hand, remember that if we reduce the thickness of the TCO, then we are sacrificing sheet resistance. These curves show that we're increasing the sheet resistance by a factor of five as we decrease the thickness by a factor of five. So this summarizes the modeling that I've just shown you. We really need to minimize the free carrier concentration to reduce the free carrier absorption. That's just exactly what you would expect. That means we need as high a mobility as we possibly can get. And the best way to do that is to focus on long relaxation time rather than looking for some new material with a reduced effective mass. If we work with a reduced effective mass, we will simply move our free carrier absorption band to a shorter wavelength. So the story is focus on the relaxation time. Reduced film thickness may be a help, but we have to think of adding additional sheet resistance to the TCO, which in turn will add to the series resistance of our device, and you saw in the last lecture how that could damage device performance. Now there's another effect that we should mention called the Bernstein Moss effect. And this occurs for very high uh, carrier concentrations, and the way it manifests itself is a shift to higher energy of the apparent band gap. And this happens because the electron concentration is so high that the Fermi energy that we use to represent the, the electron population has actually moved into the conduction band. Now remember, if a state is filled, if an electron state is filled, then it's inaccessible to other electrons. You can only have about one electron in that state, or I suppose two if you think about spin. So if we activate an electron from the valence band to the conduction band, it has to be to an empty state. And the first empty state that the ionized electrons see 
is at the Fermi energy because the material is degenerate. When the Fermi level is in the conduction band, we talk about the semiconductor as being degenerate. And that's why we see this apparent shift of the band gap. It's not really the fundamental band gap. It's a shift of what's called the optical band gap. And the magnitude of the shift that uh, the two scientists, Burstein in Israel and Moss in England, independently formulated back in the 1950s is, is this. This shows the shift in the optical gap as a function of the carrier concentration. In other words, the shift varies as carrier concentration to the two-thirds power. MCV is a, a different parameter that we haven't talked about yet. It takes into account the shape of both the conduction and the valence band. It's given by this expression here. The reciprocal of MCV, the reduced effective mass, is equal to the sum of the conduction and valence band effective masses. If we plot, if, if this is a diagram of what I've just been saying, the, the electron energy plotted against wave vector in this case. And here's the shape of the conduction band. And here is the very, very flat uh, valence band corresponding to the bound states. This is the fundamental band gap between the minimum and the maximum. So this is EG0. Here is the Fermi level that I've shifted into the, the conduction band. And this is the amount delta EG, the quantity that varies as n to the 2 thirds. And in this plot, I took the band gap as 3.7, which is very typical of a TCO like indium tin oxide. I took an effective mass of 0.33, a valence band mass of 6 Me. And, and these seem like reasonable guesses for, for typical TCOs. And this is the calculated shift, the Burstein Moss shift, as a function of carrier concentration. I worked in meters to the minus 3 for these calculations, just for consistency of the dimensions can be, be formulated. And the point to note is that at 5, let's look at this point, 5 times 10 to the 26 meters to the minus 3, or 5 times 10 to the 20 centimeters to the minus 3. You can see that the shift in the optical band gap is around about 0.7 or 0.8 of an electron volt. It's an absolutely huge amount. So in other words, the, the apparent band gap changes from maybe 3.7 all the way to 4.5 or thereabouts. Moves right into the UV part of the spectrum. I mentioned that this applies only to parabolic bands. This is just for, for, for people who, who know about solid state physics. The, the, the valence and the conduction bands don't have to be parabolic. They may not vary as, as wave vector to the, the second power. This is a set of data that a, a student of mine from many years ago obtained. Aluminium doped uh, zinc oxide. You can see the, the different amounts of aluminium that we added in the yellow points here. I hope you can see those. They correspond to 0.73 atomic percent, 0.04 atomic percent right there, 2.4 for the red, 5.1 for the blue, and 7.3 for the aluminium. And you can see that there's a, a systematic shift with a, an additional aluminium to higher and higher photon energies. And that's ex exactly what we would expect of the burstein moss effect. So to summarize all of that, we, we concentrated on the optical properties, but I could have talked about the electrical properties and the mechanisms of scattering of the electrons, the mechanisms that actually lead to reduced uh, electron mobility. 
but uh, time hasn't uh, permitted that, unfortunately. In the thin film cells, as I've kept emphasizing, the TCOs are critical elements, both optically and electrically, and they may have effects structurally as well that we aren't always aware of. The electron band structure may also be important. Remember that the TCO is just one of a number of layers, and the interface with, for example, cadmium sulfide may also be very important. If there are spikes in the energy band or the, or the, in the, the conduction or valence bands, they may also be important in determining how the cell performs. And again, to summarize what I've said about six times already, we need to focus on developing materials with high mobilities and reasonable. Reasonable means about 10 to the 20 per centimeter cubed electrons. Not 10 to the 21, but 10 to the 20 uh, concentrations. That's what will lead to, to a good quality TCO for a thin film solar cell. Okay, that's the end of this talk. Again, I'll happily answer any questions if I can.